Hello, it's David Woolley again, the curator from the Tank Museum. And as most of you who are watching this probably realise, we're not at the Tank Museum. Uh, Tank Museum's still closed, so we're trying to give you content, doing a question and answer session all the way from back here at, uh, at home. Um, we've got some of the questions that have come in. I'll also talk about some of the products we've got for sale in the shop. And uh, as before, I'll get straight on with it. Um, one of the things that a number of people asked about is why different countries have, uh, you know, are there advantages, disadvantages for why different countries put the drive sprocket on a tank at the front in some cases, or in some cases on the back? What, what, why that difference? Because obviously, you know, it doesn't take too much thought to think through that you've got a major set of issues there. I've got an illustration I'll jump up in a moment to show you to, to try and explain those pros and cons. Um, but again, just for the different people watching, not everyone's going to have you know, that high level interest or knowledge about tanks. But just basically, start at the beginning. Why do tanks have tracks? Tracks spread the weight out uh, over the ground for a very heavy vehicle. If you've got a 30 tonne Sherman or a 60 tonne Tiger and uh, big heavy weighted vehicles, if you put them on wheels, the point of pressure, um, they're the ground pressure under the bit of the wheel that's actually going to be on the ground is going to be quite high and it's going to sink in. By putting a track on, what you're doing is the nominal ground pressure, the ground pressure underneath that area on the track is going to be spread out. So a heavier vehicle can go across softer ground without getting stuck or also undulating ground, which is another one of those issues that, that tanks have to face up to. So in the first place, the idea of the track, it's like taking your own roadway that you're laying in front of you all the time. The sprocketed wheel, the wheel with the teeth on that is driven by the engine, bites into that track and pulls the vehicle along the track. The road wheels, those wheels that go across the bottom of the track, um, they are not powered at all in most vehicles. They are just there to spread the weight across as it rolls along. And the idler wheel, which is always at the opposite end from where the sprocket wheel is, that's there to keep that track nice and tense so it doesn't flop off. And so what you're doing with track is you're laying down that roadway, you're biting into it with the powered wheel from the engine, the sprocket, pulling the vehicle along that roadway, picking it up behind you and throwing it forward again. That's the idea behind tracks and that idea that you can therefore get a nominal ground pressure beneath the track amazingly on, for example, a Scorpion light tank, the nominal ground pressure. In other words, that idea, the weight going into the pressure point beneath the track is less than the weight going down from a human foot. Um, that's how clever track technology can be. So why the front and the back? And for this, I'm going to jump up for you and just show you because I can hold it from here, but I don't think you'll see it. So let me come forward. And what I've done here, which hopefully you can see, is here we've got a front wheel drive vehicle. And what I've tried to do here is show there's the sprocket at the front. There's the track going all the way round, and there's the idler sprocket at the back. These are those road wheel ones um, that we're having a look at there. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of putting it at the front? Well, at the front, what you get is as that's turning, um, you've got the slack on the track because it's pulling this track nice and tense across the top here. That slack piece of track is immediately after going round the sprocket. And the downside of that is obviously if the track here is a slacker's point, that could mean that front road wheel has a chance of running off the track at the front there. The advantages of this system, as you're looking at it, is all the way along here, the track as it moves forward to go around the sprocket, it's got a chance to bounce off all the mud and stones and everything else all the way along here before it gets to the sprocket, which means that's less wear and tear on the sprocket life. So that's one of the advantages and one of the disadvantages of that system. I'm just gonna check my notes here in case I forget anyone else says. Um, another one of the um, ways you might look at this as well, that the advantage there is if the drivers in the front, which most vehicles they are, his actual control linkages for how you steer and control these uh, sprockets, etc 
is going to be less. And if it was sending it all the way to the back, therefore, whether it's hydraulic, mechanical, whatever means of controlling, it's got to go all through the vehicle and that takes up space, etc. So there's another advantage from the front there. Right, so let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of placing, oh, where are we? We've lost him. Um, of placing Paul, come on to yourself for a moment. Here we go. Of placing the drive sprocket at the rear. Um, so what's the advantage there? So if the vehicle is going in this direction, you place the drive sprocket here. The, the track tends to be slack across the top because it's being pulled tight here. So relatively speaking, there's a smaller area um, of very tight track under tension just here. But that also means that as that vehicle has moved forward, going over the muddy ground, it's picking up a lot of mud and stones on that track, depending, of course, on the surface. It has a very short distance to lose those mud and stones before it reaches a drive sprocket, which tends to mean on a real wheel drive sprocket on a vehicle like a tank, that sprocket gets worn out quicker because of the amount of stones and muck that gets in the teeth there. Um, you've got the idler wheel here on the front and again going back to my notes what we've tended to say on this one is um, there's less chance with the slack across the top here of the track running off as opposed to at the beginning where the track was you know on the drive sprocket at the front easier chance of it running off there um, there's less tension also on the idler wheel by having it this way round, um, which is an advantage. Um, and there's also, uh, I mentioned, the smaller distance to shed dirt, which is a disadvantage. And as I mentioned on the earlier one as well, the problem you've now got is you've now got, if you're in the front, the control linkages have got further to go to control uh, steering, etc., etc., on the back there. So again, occupying more space if you're going all the way through to the back. Um, so I hope that gives, however crudely, a little bit of an explanation of the pros and cons of why you put them at the front. Now there's other reasonings as well that you can think of. It doesn't take too much to work out as well. If you do, for example, the drive at the front, that quite often means the gearbox is there. So think of a Sherman with that housing on the front. Some of it are bolted on housing with the gearbox in. That is extra protection, if you think about it, for the driver and the co-driver behind it. So sometimes that working in that manner of having uh, thicker armour in a way, because all the transmission is, ad is adding to the amount going through. Just like in the Merkava, for example, the engine being in front of most of the crew compartment gives more protection to the crew inside. It's just a physical barrier still. Um, so there's other things you can see that will add to that picture about why you might want to move it forward and back. Most countries these days seem to have gone for the drive sprocket at the rear. And uh, so I'll go and sit back down. The obvious one that there, there's there is it means you've got uh, the idea of having to take all that transmission power through to the front of the vehicle uh, is negated by having it. Um, and quite often with the engine, uh, what they now call a power pack, the engine and the gearbox are all put together at the rear of the vehicle. So that's all complete there, rather than a transmission going through the vehicle to the front, um, where you're going to end up having problems there within the sense of how do you actually do that in the space of a tank. And you only have to look like a vehicle like a Stuart, which uh, the driver and the co-driver in the front there, sitting on right next to this big housing, which takes a transmission through, and it's quite high as well because the radial engine in the back of most Stuarts meant the power dry shaft comes off in the middle, aeroplane engine, think of it like the propeller in the middle there. So that come, is coming quite high. So again, that drive shaft going all the way through the vehicle is still quite high up by the time it reaches the front. So a uh, number of issues there coming out uh, uh, about pros and cons for rear and uh, uh, front drive sprockets. So I hope that answers some of your questions there and uh, that business about track technology, another whole subject area that's always quite interesting. 
So next question, um, a number of people have asked over time, you know, uh, information, where do we get our information from for things like tank chats, etc.? Some of it is very common knowledge information. Sometimes, you know, it can be quite surprising. Um, now for myself, uh, depending on what country's vehicles you're looking at, there's certain authors I'd always go to, um, but we've got the great advantage of the Tank Museum of having a really good archive and library. At the moment, as you can imagine, we don't have access to that. I can't look up certain things. Um, there's, I, I tend to like, in some, some particular cases, going to what you might call the, the root source of the information, i.e. the official reports, trial reports, etc., that sometimes can give you a picture. Um, inevitably, we always get influenced by how that story's been interpreted over time. And I you know, don't mind admitting we all do it. We all repeat facts sometimes that if only you went back and looked a bit further, you'd find that fact that we're being all told now is not necessarily true. Um, but it, I thought it would also give me an opportunity to uh, make a mention here of, of uh, some of the things we sell in the shop because, um, and I didn't set this up in any way, that's one of the books, the Haynes books, we sell in the shop. And in there are my notes I was making before we were doing the tank chat on the Chieftains. So in some of these cases, there's information that's been published especially on the British tanks, the post-war ones, Centurion, Chieftain, Challenger 1, Challenger 2, that's been put in there, that's really been grabbed from our archive, not necessarily for the very first time, but being placed in one place for the first time, and along with really good developmental history. And why I say all that is because of, I'm bound to be saying this, aren't I? Buy yourself one of those Haynes manuals from our shop um, because we've got some really good offers on those at the moment. There's a really interesting range of them and genuinely in a number of them there, there's great research, there's great information, there's a lot of good stuff. Great imagery if you're a model maker uh, and technical as well. You know, what are those stories behind the development of some of these vehicles? Where have some of these myths come from? And there's also in a number of those ones really good first hand accounts inserted in there of the users. And I mentioned this, we've just got a restock of some of the Haynes manuals in our shop. Um, and I'd say this in general as well if there was things you were trying to order before, that it looked like we'd sold out. In some cases, we've been able to restock, so go back and have a look. And the other really good news as well is we've been able to do a better deal with uh, about postage. So again, if you were put off by the postage before, do go back and have another look there um, because it may well be worth your while now. And, and thanks very much. One or two people made the point that they were trying to buy things to support us and it was probably easier for them to give us some money or join patrons is a better way of doing it than spending a lot on postage and not really um, you know, getting one small item for that or something. Revisit, um, have another look and you'll see some of the items we've stocked up again. And I say the Haynes one because we were involved in writing some of these. Um, if you've got any doubts, if you just think to me is, is, is selling it, look at the reviews on Amazon as well because there's really good reviews there. Some of you I know have got these books, you can put it in the comments if you think they're good or rubbish or whatever, you know. But I'd like to say I think these are real good ones. So there's our Chieftain one there. Um, we've just got a last lot really of the Tiger ones coming in, which is still a brilliant one on the Tiger. If you like your images, the only thing that's changed on that is literally the first moments of its capture in the sense it may have been a different day rather than the one that we've got recorded here. But lots of good stuff on the Tiger, good photo shoots, um, the histories, how, we, how people remade Zimmer, it, all sorts of things in that Tiger manual. Uh, there's our Rolls-Royce one that David Fletcher did, excellent on the Rolls-Royce there. And again, some of these I know we've got at real knockdown prices. The first World War tank one, if you're interested in anything, well, frankly, if you're interested in any tanks at all, you ought to be having a copy of that because it puts the tank, its invention in context. Mark IV tank, the one we made the most of in Britain, some great photo shoots, how you drive it, blueprints, you name it, are in there. Some really good ones too. Uh, Churchill tank. Um, that we've done there as well. Nigel Montgomery did that one from the Churchill Trust and there's our Challenger 2 one as well which uh, talks about uh, an in-service vehicle and the developmental issues that went behind that. Um, so do have a look at those. As I say, I, I can't strongly recommend them enough. I think they're great ones. Um, and I was just trying to find, I actually wrote a list out of all the other ones. We've got also, there's an Abrams one there, Panther, um, T-34, there's a Sherman one, the Centurion. I know one of the people actually asked me, what do I read on Centurion? 
I'd say start off on that Haynes one because there's probably more in there. Um, some of the other publications on Centurion, you know, they're great, but they're older and thinner. Um, that Centurion manual is a really good book. You know, it's chunky enough, great imagery, etc. Panzer three we've got, and there's other ones we've got, nothing to do with us producing, but you know, we've got other Haynes manuals there. There's one on the 88 millimeter gun. We've got some airplanes ones, etc. So do have a look there on the website. Right, on to some one or two other questions as well. Um, I mentioned, uh, sorry, I was, I was moving on, but I'm not. We've also got, uh, some of you were talking about these inflatable shells before liking them, wanting an 88. I'm told that uh, we will be having 88 millimeters back in stock. By the time this video comes out, they should be back in the stock as well. So if you're after one of the inflatables, Tank Museum website, go to the shop. And if you've got any trouble finding things, just um, tap in inflatable shell or something like that in that search bit, it'll come up with you. So that's another one of those areas where, and uh, I know a number of people as well also brought up the fact, surely if this is a 17 pounder, why red? The red is not high explosive in the sense of a bursting charge in a 17 pounder. The red is warning there's an explosive in there and that explosive in this case is tracer, the element that's tracer. So 17 pounder armor piercing, uh, ballistic capped, round doesn't have a bursting charge but it does have some form of explosive which glows which is a tracer hence they give it that red banding warning about that as well um right let's have a look at other question uh zombie moses asked a question here he said um with cultural property this issue so many museums are being approached by countries saying give us our stuff back now um has any countries or cultural groups come to the tank museum saying can we have a tank back um, now it's interesting because uh, in a weird way, yes, it has happened. We get it all the time, jokingly. I get people saying, oh, give us you know, our tiger back to Germany and everything. And I jokingly say in reply, win a war first, first mate. Um, but the irony is the tank museum has given a tank back to Germany. And if you'd like to see about it, go on to Pathé, go on Google, look up Pathé, um, look at um, Nazi tank returned. And in 1960, you'll see a running Panzer IV, it's lovely footage inside the tank museum being taken as the tank museum then had surplus Panzer IVs uh, loaded on a load loader with the young German soldiers there being shipped back to help establish the new German tank museum in Munster and other vehicles, uh, I think a Panzer II went as well later on. So uh, yes, vehicles have gone back. Um, the interesting, where I think there is a bit of a difference, if you can imagine across time, cultural property is always going to be a contentious argument. You think of some of those British regimental museums with items that were taken from the, the palace in uh, uh, you know, what's now Beijing, Peking in the past, you know, at the turn of the last century, um, looted items like that, that are now ironically sitting, hugely valuable, rare items in British regimental museums, some of which are probably thinking, do I want to keep this or is it really core to my story or would it be better um, going back to China? So sometimes there are items that museums, military museums may be, when approached would be thinking like, OK, maybe this is the time for that to go back to that originator country. There's other times where um, the law around military property and captured equipment, um, you know, you don't go handing stuff back to what beca might become a, uh, a terrorist group, an erstwhile enemy, all sorts of things as well. And that you can also imagine the huge emotion, emotional thing of going to some regimental museums, including our own, etc., and saying to them things like, oh, OK, can we give that back now when it was a symbol of as a trophy or a victory when it was captured in the first place? So you only have to think of all those British regimental museums with uh, standards or eagles that were captured at things like Waterloo. Or and we have an American uh, group of Philadelphia, a really old unit that used to come or still comes to the tank museum from the USA. They date back to a cavalry unit and they've got some British standards that were captured. So again, that idea, you know, that idea of, of offering up what was fought over literally, um, people died over some of these things, is, is, it's not likely to happen in that way. So um, there are laws around this, they're very strict laws. It'll probably, things will, will change as time goes on. Um, but certainly at the moment, uh, when I get these jokey emails saying, give us, give us our tiger back, it belongs to Germany, etc. You ain't getting that one, I'm sorry, chum. 
But the good news is military museums are good, as most museums, about loaning things back and forward. So this idea about, you know, where, who really owns it, uh, you know, maybe one question, but the idea it gets out there. So uh, at the moment, one of our King Tigers is actually out in, in Holland at the moment on loan. So um, you can go to Sersterberg and see that there. So things get moved around that way. Um, right, what else have we got here? We've got another, someone called, is it Interons asked, um, just to give us another one of those stories about, you know, how do we acquire our tanks, etc. So I've just almost touched on that to a certain degree, the result of warfare where captured material is brought back for evaluation, ultimately it then gets passed over to the tank museum. Um, I just want to tell another one of those stories where it doesn't always come the usual routes. Um, some of you, I know if you're ex-service, you may remember a name, Colonel John Gilman, who at one point was put in charge of what used to be called DI-60, Defence Intelligence, and they'd be doing this analysis of captured vehicles, what the threat is out there, how do we keep an eye on uh, the enemy's capabilities, etc. And sometimes material would be acquired, uh, sometimes legitimately purchased through the system, sometimes through all these dodgy deals, I can talk about that as well in the future, but there was a reason the British Army ended up getting some uh, T-34-85 tanks. Um, not that many, you know, we're not talking back in the 50s, this was much later. And uh, one of these was turning up in good order and Colonel John Gilman, uh, who was a great supporter of the tank museum, he managed to do it in a way that this tank, instead of going off for evaluation or to the army firing range, which is what I think they were going to be using it for, uh, it was dropped off over almost overnight in the car park of the tank museum another vehicle replaced it and off it went for that firing trial or range and we ended up with a very good T-3485 that till fairly recently with our runner and we're going to get it back into running order in the future. So sometimes little bits of subterfuge and uh, in a sense that comes on to another question which um, I haven't got the chap's name in front of me but he says could we say something about the, uh, the T-80 story? Um, if you're interested in that Cold War period, look at the books on Bricksmith, how we were trying to find out what was the capabilities of, what was it, you know, almost back to those James Bond days, you know, what, what, what is it we were trying to, you know, how thick was the armour? What was this, seriously the penetration that that latest Soviet gun, um, what could it have gone through, what we should be worried about, etc. Now, that Bricksmith story is a great one. Look up that, you know, there's some good books on it, great stories. There's also just those other classic military intelligence stories. I'd love to be able to share with you some of what we know about that T-80 story. It has been answered as a parliamentary question that it existed. It's in the country. Uh, I can't tell you that story. Um, one day we hope it comes out and that'll be another one of those great stories we'll be able to put in the museum. Um, but there is a T-80 in the, in the UK. Uh, fantastic story behind, it, behind how it got here. And of course, you know, let's not kid ourselves, these things are going on all the time. Different countries trying to find out what the capabilities are of the other side. And uh, some of that's just attending trade fairs. Some of it's, um, you know, espionage and those, those sort of things are going on. So that you know what you've got in your armoury. Is it worth having? Will it defeat that enemy when they come around the corner in the future? Um, so where are we getting to? So going through some more questions here. Um, Bill Din um, from Iowa says, please, David, would you not keep repeating yourself? Uh, so Bill Din from Iowa says, please, David, will you stop repeating yourself? Um, Nerfez uh, asked the question about Burstin and his Motor Geschutz vehicle. Um, and he's basically, the question he's asked is, would the Austro-Hungarians have had an advantage in the war if they'd taken up Burstin's auto or Motor Geschutz design? Now, if you don't know about Burstin and the Motor Geschutz design, um, if you look, they've done a really good replica out in Austria. Um, Burstin comes to, as a designer, comes uh, as a military man, comes to the German, Austro-Hungarian, sorry, Austro-Hungarian military and says, look, I've got this design. And when you see it, pre-First World War, it looks so much like a tank. It's got tracks, it's got extendable uh, arms to help it cross rough ground. It's got a turret on the top with a gun in. Um, the Austro-Hungarians reject it. Just as Lancelot de Mole comes up with an idea out in Australia, sends it to the British, the British War Office, again before the First World War. And uh, the, the, it's one of these tricky ones, which is 
how do we look at technology when we all have the benefit of hindsight? We know World War come, One comes along, something called the tank comes up. Why didn't they pick up on that earlier? Um, I think one of the biggest issues that we forget here is as every military through history has got, we've mentioned it before, budgets, what's their main threat? What do they consider that they should be really thinking about? And the Austro-Hungarians, what would have been a use for the Austro-Hungarian army pre-World War I, not knowing it was going to be this siege warfare, etc., for having what was bound to be a slow, heavily armoured vehicle why would we want to take that into service when so many of the world, you know, yes, they've had the uh, uh, Sino-Japanese war or Russia and Japan fighting siege warfare that way. So there are some examples of this type of siege warfare that has happened earlier. But really, the idea of this breakthrough weapon of a tank, it's, it, it doesn't really have a role. Or if it does have a role, it's going to be a very specific occasion. And my analogy on this, we did in one of the books one time, it's like somebody going up to uh, a government now saying, here, I've got this fantastic new design that will be perfect for knocking out Martians when they land. And what's most governments going to be doing? They're going to be saying, why do I want to invest lots of money into something that really we don't see as a threat? It might come one day in the future, Martians might invade, but if I was to put money into every possibility, um, unless I can see some enormous adaptability, etc., with that particular thing now, why on earth would we invest in it now when it's not necessarily a problem? And that, I think, is the analogy I'd use back to the Austrians back before First World War. Yes, ideas have been around for quite some time about the tank, very similar things, and Burstins is a great one because when you look at it, it really does look like a tank. It's not like some of these other designs where the concept's there, but it doesn't really look that like Sims War Car, etc. But even though militaries do look at these things, they are not stupid all the time. They're not just sort of saying, oh, we don't want it, you know, whatever. Um, they are, just like the British military looked at track vehicles, 1907, the Hornsby, um, was being looked at as towing guns. But quite rightly at the time, they said, look, it's still in its early days. It probably will develop into something, but we are not going to get rid of all our very effective horse-drawn artillery just to now start taking on something that is in its infantry. But we'll keep an eye on you and we'll come back, you know, come back to us when we think something's developed further. So I think we've got to give those militaries a little bit more leeway than just saying, oh, they were blind, they were whatever. Would it have made a difference? Uh, here we go, that, those are what-if ones, you know, if other countries had got them earlier. Um, whether you think the Austrian-Hungarian military would have been, you know, Western Front style or something, from where they were fighting, there was less uh, of that need, I would argue, for that breakthrough type weapon. Western Front is really that one that is pushing the development of the tank. Um, right, so one or two other things I wanted to mention about for the shop things. Um, one of the guys, Andrew Phillips, um, he, he came out with a line saying uh, about after we did our Fury review and he says, ladies, never watch a war film with a bloke or even worse, a number of blokes. Well, number one, Andrew Phillips, how the hell do you get a lady to watch a war film in the first place? So good luck if you've got that far. Um, but uh, one of the things there that, that, that you know, this, this knocked on to was... Uh, some of you are lucky boys out there and some of you we, we all really ought to be thanking. So some of you who do have ladies and families um, that maybe they're not that interested in tanks. But how can we entice you um, if you are going to go and buy one of those nice Haynes manuals from the shop for your own interest? Um, what about the kids and what about the other things that you might want to be doing as a group or as a family? So, which is why I've brought out here Tank Museum Monopoly. You can play that with everyone. Uh, Tank Museum Cluedo. Yeah, there's another one of those games there. We've got those in stock. You might want to have a think about playing. And we've also got other titles as well. Books, that, again, if you've got younger members in the family, Michael Mopergo, uh, War Horse, really worth reading. I think that's another one they're still reading, uh, certainly in British schools, as uh, part of the curriculum. So that might be one you might want to have a think about. Other classics. These are some of the, look at that one, $2.99 in the shop as well, all quiet on the Western Front. Seriously, if you haven't read it, you ought to. And again, then go and have a look, read some of the reviews and uh, the essay in there as well, from the point of view of, well, putting that in a context. Why were certain books like this so important when they came out and why are they still hark back to in terms of the literature? 
Um, again, farewell to arms, Hemingway, if you like Hemingway, not everyone's a Hemingway felt, but another great read there for 2 dollars um, Another one we've got, uh, instead of interpretation of what people are saying, there's another great one to read, Heinz Guderian. We've got that, it's 2 dollars Achtung Panzer. So that's his memoir that, uh, again, he rewrites after the, uh, well, big story behind that about what goes in there who was he trying to please what was he trying to do but really worth the read that's his memoir as one of those uh, key people in the tank 1930 development but certainly in the use of the panzer war for the, the german tank arm in world war ii another one for other members of the families everyone should have read it i'm sure most of the school kids have still got that on the list you should have done because again in terms of putting that other bits of the war in a context and frank's diary um, we've got that one in the shop there, nice and cheap. And again, for all this business in Britain at the moment, as I'm doing this, we're just going through VA Day commemorations, etc. Um, what was it like in the war? Good Night, Mr. Tom, made into a wonderful television series, great read still, um, and for youngsters as well and teenagers, giving you that context. What was it like being a, a kid in wartime Britain? That's a great read there. And we've got quite a lot of other numbers. Have a look at them. And again, this was one that sometimes, you know, you can look at those cheap end paperbacks and think, well, what am I going to learn? Finest out, it's a brief life for Churchill. Cracking reviews, really good reviews of that one. So that's another one of those ones. If we're not going to sit there and read those great big thick uh, tomes on Churchill, what is it we should know about Churchill? Have a go at that one. That's a really good one I'd recommend there as well. So. Um, there's some of those cheaper end reads and I know people you know we I'm not just saying this in the you know what what is it we should be reading and everything else and another point I'd say as well which is I've said if you've come to our Tiger Days one thing I always say is when's the time great you're not going to get um, you know those are great cheap books when's the time you should spend some more money on a book now I've mentioned those Haynes manuals for great illustrations etc and some really good prices there as well but also for you model makers, for the real enthusiasts, etc., if you've got that money, when's it worth buying the better book? And one of the things I always think about is, is the quality of the prints that are in there. So that again, you know, we've all bought that book, haven't we? That it's been cheap, it's been remaindered, it's got terrible photos in, we've seen them all before, and you suddenly realise you've just spent a fiver on something that's really, you've spent five pounds for two new photos and they're not even that interesting ones that you hadn't seen before. So when do we save that money and spend a little bit more on something that's really worth it? And what I was going to show you here, we've got um, some lovely, if you're into your German tanks, um, these uh, Culverin Fies, two guys have been writing on German tanks, beautiful quality imagery, one on Tiger tanks, one on the Panther story as well. And they are the ones where if it's worth spending a bit more money, I'd recommend these ones because the quality of the prints in there, fantastic, wonderfully reproduced um, books and very, very well done. So that again, if you are that model maker wanting to do the diorama or again, because of the photo shoots in here, showing you those details, not all the other books get there. And uh, that does bring me on actually. So I started by saying about, you know, some of these, you know, if you're big and big self-indulgent, I mentioned before, there's some of us, we're going through feast and famine, aren't we, at the moment? Some people have probably got more money in the bank at the moment than they've probably ever had because they're not having to travel to work and do other things. Some people are going bust, you know, that, that's just, you know, one of those terrible situations. And there's also a lot of you, I know, you know, this idea of all sitting at home in the sunshine, etc. I know a lot of you are going out there and really um, still having to earn your keep, still having to find your way through in all these new circumstances. And for those essential workers and health workers as well, um, you know, good on you. I've said it before, please, you know, thank you so much for what we're doing. We hope this isn't, you know, doing in any way rubbing your noses in it as if we're all having fun while you're working hard. And I just want to mention that as well, because a young lady who, who contacted us from Grimsby said uh, her fella, whose name's Michael Fuller, he's a paramedic. He has one hell of a day, as you can imagine, in the circumstances like this but he enjoys these tank chats, etc. something to let him drop it all behind. So uh, Michael Fuller, number one, she's obviously a keeper. I haven't got her name, um, but you're going to have to buy her something really interested and see, as our dear friend Andrew Phillips said, 
can you persuade, if you're the guy that can persuade someone to sit with you and watch these tank chats and watch these question and answers, um, good on you, mate, and give us the art. Because hell, if, if you can persuade your obviously very devoted young lady who's contacted us to say, give you a, you know, give you a bit of a call out at the moment, um, see if you can get her to watch some of these things because if anyone gets the art there wow well done you know that's that's quite something if you can actually get the other side of the family involved in uh, being interested in tanks as well um one one thing that uh, uh john pardon uh he was i think he's in the netherlands he said why aren't other museums doing this well actually they are and uh in sersterberg so our friends at the national military museum we'll do a link i think uh, if it's or we have done a link, look on our Facebook, to one of the videos they've done. Um, we've got Stefan, who we've known for years out in Sweden. He's done a great film on how you eat in a tank. Really, really witty bit of stuff. So do have a look out for Stefan and uh, the Swedish Tanks Museum's effort. And there's another guy, uh, Franz Brodel, we know very well as well. And he's been doing some fantastic films as well out in Austria. He's at the uh, Austrian Military Museum. Um, so have a look around as well because uh, there are other museums doing this. The only one I would say, and I won't mention his name and embarrass the poor guy, um, he says, why aren't we doing about battleships? We're the tank museum. Okay, so that's why we're going to be doing that. Keep your comments coming, keep them decent, try and keep them constructive and keep the questions coming as well and we'll try and get some more questions back to you. So uh, thank you as ever for those of you who have bought things. As I said, go back to that shop have another look because sometimes we have been able to restock. We've got the 88 millimeter shells back in, that sort of thing. Some of the books have come back in, not everything we can. You can imagine in circumstances like this, um, always a bit of a problem trying to get resupplied. You know, not all the suppliers are there at the moment, but um, do please keep supporting us, keep an eye on what we're up to and uh, stay safe. And uh, as I keep saying, interesting times. I, Finn's he's out of shot I think at the moment Finn's down there fast asleep he's earlier on he's by the way the one thing he he gets on with is a jigsaw puzzle I'll show you that so 4.99 for a really good jigsaw that's another good one there